Well, hello. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Noel FM, to another episode of Novak Weekly Podcast. We are back, baby. After two week absence, apologies for that, but I think most of you are familiar with the reasoning behind it. Uh, I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, in today's episode, we'll preview and give our predictions for the Paris Masters. We'll talk the Uran battle for the world number one spot between Novak and Carlos Alcaraz. And Djokovic is almost seven week hiatus from tennis, which is something that I think never happened before. Uh, also, we'll give our thoughts on uh, Novak's response to those now infamous Rafa Nadal comments. I know that, you know, it's been a couple of weeks since that interview Novak did with uh, Jelena Medic from Sportal Serbia, but I felt like we had, you know, uh, I didn't just want to brush them aside. Uh, joining me to discuss all of this, as he does always, is my good friend from Italy, Mario Bocardi. Mario, how are you, buddy? I have to say, it's so great to see you again, and it's great to be, you know, talking tennis and talking Novak again with you. Thank you. Hi, everyone, first of all. And hi, Marco. It's I'm very happy to be to be here again since, you know, a couple of weeks without doing this. La last time you did this, I, I wasn't here. So uh, very happy to, to be back. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Honestly, I can't wait. So without further ado, uh, let's jump into this. Uh, first of all, as I said, uh, the first topic, uh, Paris Masters. You saw the draw. Uh, your gi yes. give us, give me, give me your first thoughts on yeah, Novak's okay. on Novak's part, uh, and uh, you know, in in general, what do you think? Yes. Um, first of all, uh, by the time that we speak, uh, there's not gonna be uh, first of all a round three clash between Novak and Ben Shelton, and that's for sure. So I will take that into consideration for uh, my thoughts on the draw because uh, it's Davidovich Fokina who won. Who is actually uh, an opponent that um, Novak already beat a few times. He lost to him in Monte Carlo once. Um, a lot of tight matches. For example, in the, in the, at the French Open this year, we saw uh, the longest ever straight sets win of Novak's career against Davidovic, uh, which I think is the, um, the most dangerous players among the, um, the guys he can face in... Uh, until the the round three quarter final. Overall, his draw yeah, is not. Uh, yeah, let's just not... let's just yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Let's just you know, quickly say basically his path to the finals. I mean, he yeah. he always he already you know has a buy in the first round. Then second round. I mean, I'm talking based on seedings and rankings. Yes, should be Kaspanovic him, or Echeverri. Uh, Echeverri. Uh, round three already said that you know Ben Shelton is out, so. Should be Davidovich Fokina quarterfinals, Rune or Fritz, semis, Sinner or uh, Andre Rublev, and in the final, Alcaraz or Daniil Medvedev, unless you know something something changes, yeah, or we see, yeah. So please continue. Um, no, yeah, so uh, I would say that, um, you know, in some way, I don't think that today's result, uh, the one I was talking about, about Ben Shelton being out. Uh, to Davidovich changes a lot on the perception I, I have on the draw because I think that regardless of, of the ranking uh, and some great results Shelton had this year on hard, they are more or less, you know, uh, two high quality opponents for, for a round three. Um, yeah, I would say that the draw looks quite tough. Uh, even if, for example, quarterfinal against Rune... Uh, it's not that easy for Rune to get there, first of all. And if he gets there, probably we need to see if he really regained that form. Uh, he won some matches last week in, in Basel, uh, then had a tough defeat against Roger Aliasim, winning just five games. Uh, so um, a little bit of ups and downs, for sure, some improvements for him uh, because he wasn't winning matches at all uh, till going to Basel and found yeah. uh, found finally some wins in Switzerland. Uh, probably the semi-final can be really tough uh, because Sinner and Rublev are two, two very inform, uh, inform opponents. Um, but I really trust Novak on, in the Paris Masters. Uh, I think the conditions are, are really good for him. Um, I honestly think that 
uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to, to defeat him. Uh, you know, you always need to bring some, some, some kind of an extra performance to do it in that tournament. For example, what did Rune in the final last year, even if Novak, we know that he, he, he kind of missed a lot of opportunities in, in that match. But overall, he, he plays incredibly, uh, especially this since, you know, 2013, when he won the second time. After that, in the last decade, he, he's really been always mm, very, very uh, good there. Losing twice in the final, but winning overall six title, while nobody else has even three. Yeah, he'll, yeah, uh, he, no, literally hold, yeah he literally holds all the records, whether it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. times, times it, the tournaments, it's, it's was a won, very good finals, tournament. whatever. It's a very good tournament. I mean, this year he, he had a loss in one of his best tournaments on the tour, which was Rome. Uh, but overall, it's difficult for me to imagine him not doing well in, in Paris, even because um, as long as I know, I, I think that his uh, mental and physical shape he, is good. Is coming off from his 24th major, some weeks off. So probably, you know, first match maybe can a be lot a lot of weeks off. Of, yeah, uh, a lot of um, a little bit of rustiness, maybe. Uh, you know, even because the 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 second round will not be that easy because uh, you know, um, ready go playing against either Ketsmanovic or Echeverry, who was playing very well uh, last week. Um, yeah, give me, you know give, me give me give 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 yeah. me your quick comments when it comes to round two because Novak has I mean it, he has the positive score against most of them but it's three nil against uh, Kitsmanovic it's one nil against Thomas Echeverry uh, both of these guys had a I would say solid post US Open you know run uh, Echeverry played what is it yeah quarterfinals of Basel last week but. He also had quarterfinals in Zhuhai and round 16 in Beijing. Yeah, but uh, especially well, well, last week, uh, I would say especially last week was a very positive one for, for Thomas uh, because, you know, that mm, I would say also unlucky defeat against Rune because of, for example, that net court, that six all in the deciding set tie break. So it was a really, really close battle against Rune. But he also uh, scored two very nice wins because beating back-to-back -back Corda and Murray uh, in hard fought matches is very good. So he's an informed opponent. Um, Ketsmanovic is not in a bad shape too because uh, did quite well uh, in, in Stockholm. Yes, uh, uh, and then was, was really cruising against Rune um, till some point of the match. He was up a set... Uh, and the break was 6 1, 4 3, and 40 15, something like that. Um, no, I'm pretty sure it was like that. Um, then we know how that match uh, um, continued because then Rune came back and got the win. But overall, I would say that his confidence should be, should be quite high right now. Um, so, um, not gonna be a, a very easy second round. I don't imagine him going out in the second round, honestly. Uh, but for sure, given a little bit of rustiness, uh, not playing for seven straight weeks, it can be a bit tough, especially at the beginning. Uh, so, you know, I can even imagine that, for, exam for example, uh, uh, a three-set win won't really surprise me uh, if he, you know, I remember also 2021, he won the title. Uh, the Paris Master, but still the second round he played Fucevic and was a very tough one, winning in three sets because it's um, it's like that in this part of his career. Us usually he ca uh, he comes into this tournament with mm, basically no matches under his belt, uh, yeah. and so uh, you know he, it can be that he needs to you know uh, getting used again to all the feelings, uh, all you know all, all what's around him. Also because having the bar in the first round. You play against a guy who who has already won a match and is already used to the conditions. Um, but overall, as I said, I I really trust Novak in this tournament uh, historically, and so I don't think that it's going to be that much different this this year. Yeah, uh, let me ask you this: If we uh, see him go out, you know, before the the final, um, who do you think has the most realistic 
chance to, to do that? Well, uh, I know that uh, the Vienna run can impact both the guys who were yesterday playing the final. Uh, so both Medvedev and Sinner. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, we're talking about Sinner because Medvedev is in, in the bottom half of the draw. Uh, but I'm really, really impressed by what I'm, what I'm seeing right now by him. And even if Novak always won in their previous matches, uh, I would say that um, he really, assuming that Sinner will, will go into Paris at 100%, uh, he really will need to, to bring a, a very, very good and solid performance, uh, better than, than what he needed to do the, the previous time they faced each other. So um, he is right now, for a lot of different reasons of form, the titles he won, also the fact that he has been able to beat top-ranked opponents because he beat you know, Medvedev twice in two different finals in lately, but also that uh, he beat Alcaraz um, and he beat him two times out of three matches they played this year. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would say that um, given also that, you know, we, we, we have understood that also these conditions are pretty, pretty good for his tennis, I would say that he is the, the opponent I would, uh, would let's say, fear, fear the most, <laughs> uh, even if I think that, um, you know, probably the Vienna run can also... Uh, impact this a little bit um, and also Rublev is in form so um, I'm expecting the semi-final to be the toughest match mm, yeah so you, you don't so you, you don't see him going out uh, before semi-finals under any circumstances uh, honestly it's uh, in my opinion it's really really difficult honestly because even in a potential cl uh, clash with Rune uh, for me, it's um, it's not that easy to imagine Rune already back at the level required to no, no, uh, to not. to uh, to outlasting Novak. Then I don't know. Tennis is <laughs> also a little bit unpredictable. So uh, we we have That's understood true. that that everything everything can all can always happen. But if you uh, are here to asking me a prediction about what can be his toughest. Uh, you know, toughest clash before the final. Um, I am thinking about the semi final because, uh, about Sinner, there's a lot that uh, we can say about how well he, he's playing. And if not Sinner, there's also Rublev in this quarter final, which is playing really, really good. And so, I don't know. Uh, I would say that he's, uh, he's still around that uh, should require him to be. Uh, focus the most yeah uh, let me ask you this uh, I, I didn't have this question prepared I just you know sort of thought of it when you were you know mentioning the guys and uh, I don't want to say that they fear him when they're playing against him at you know during grand slams uh, but there's all there, there's obviously a not all of them, but a lot of them. There's obviously a, a psychological obstacle when they, you know, face him at the Grand Slam. Do you think uh, they they feel like a lot less pressure when they face him, you know, during the, the Masters or, you know, even lesser tournaments because it's the best of three, not the best of five, and they don't have that, you know, story in that, you know, or, or, or are thinking subconsciously, you know, like, you know, this is Novak, you know, even though he's losing 2-0, you know, he can, like, easily uh, win this 3-2. What, what, what's your take um, on What's your take on that? I don't think it's a matter of pressure, to be honest, because I think that the pressure is always there because if you go into a best of three and you think that it's more likely that you can win, the pressure, you, you feel the pressure that you have the chance to beat him. So I don't think that it's um, really a, a matter of pressure, but um, it's also a matter of, um, a matter of believing uh, and also the fact that, uh, in my opinion, uh, first of all, even if Novak um, leaves his soul on the court every time he plays, there's still a little bit uh, of difference between the Grand Slams and, for example, the Masters tournaments, uh, which he really wants to win. He, he wants to, to get out with the trophy in his hands every time that he shows up at the tournament. But... Um, 
still when there's the Grand Slam, there is a, another kind of uh, pressure and energy and, uh, you know, that willingness to get his hands on, the, on that trophy, uh, which makes things even more difficult for, for his opponents. Uh, and also the fact that, of course, best of three format, you know, uh, doesn't really let him to um, even, you know, a slow start can be uh, more difficult to, yes. you know, can be then more difficult to come back and all these things. So um, even at some Grand Slams, we have seen at times uh, a little bit of a slow start in some matches. Uh, um, but it's a total different story uh, when you, for example, are, you know, a little bit tough in the first set, maybe you even lose it, but you still have a lot of time, especially if you haven't, you know, spent that many energies in a set that maybe you lost 6-4, for example. Um, best of three, it's, of course, a totally, a totally different thing because when you, uh, for example, lose the first set, um, of course probably Novak is, is still kind of the favorite, even when he loses the first set, at least at the beginning of the second. But, you know, it's, uh, it's still not easy because you, you are still in, in that situation that it's now or never more. Uh, so, um, you know, if the other guy serves incredibly well, maybe you, you are not able to break in that set and maybe you lose a tie break and the match is off, for example. Uh, it's it's a little bit, of course, different, and you know, mm, makes even the uh, let's say the upset a little bit more likely. That's for sure. Uh, and also, in my opinion, the fact that for Novak the Grand Slams, especially in the last years of in this mm, you know these years of his career, uh, are uh, a different story. He wants to win every time, but yes. Grand Slams, there's uh, you know a superior. Uh, willingness for him to even to to suffer, but to win that uh, that tournament. In, in other tournaments, he really wants to win, but um, you know, there's maybe the door is uh, just a little bit uh, more open for for his yeah, opponents. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll discuss that uh, a little bit later. Uh, let me hear you quickly about. Uh, the overall draw and, and mm -hmm. tournament. Uh, I'm going to put it uh, right here on the screen. Um, what would you say are you know some of the best matches, especially in the you know early rounds, uh, maybe potential upsets, or what do you think uh, overall when it comes to this year's edition of the Paris Masters? Okay, uh, I think that. Uh... Overall, um, mm, well, I mean, uh, I I find it uh, pretty balanced, to be honest, uh, as a draw. Even if probably Alcaraz uh, as maybe just a little bit um, easier on paper uh, than Novak. Even if the fact that there's not Nori anymore, but Safiulin. Uh, right there, I think that Safiulin is a little bit more dangerous than Nori as the opening match because he's playing really well. But overall, um, I think that he, um, you know, it's um, it's overall a good draw for him, in my opinion. Um, probably the quarterfinal against... I, I don't really see Tsitsipas beating him. Uh, Zverev lost with him um, quite a few times uh, recently, but probably still feels a little bit more dangerous. Uh, you know, also a lot will depend also, as I said about Sinner for Djokovic. I will say the same exact thing for Alcaraz. Uh, I will say that uh, a lot it will also depend if Medvedev goes uh, in Paris 100%, because if yes, uh, that potential clash uh, can really be really be tough, as we saw at the U.S. Open. Medvedev has uh, what it takes to uh, to beat him in a knockout match. Um, he already won this tournament in 2020. Was a finalist in 2021 and even won the first set against Novak uh, before losing in three. 
so he knows how to play really well here. Um, yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting. Even if uh, Medvedev's draw, in my opinion, is, is tougher because uh, a potential second round against Dimitrov, um, it's, you know, <laughs> it's really, it can be tough. Uh, as it was for him, for example, in Vienna, because their match was really, really close. Uh, and, you know, uh, a lot of guys that can serve well, uh, um, Nicolas Jarry, uh, Bublik, even Korda and Urkac in his potential quarterfinal. Um, I think that probably among the four, uh, you know, among the, f the, the top four seats, probably Medvedev is the one who who has the, probably the most difficult path. Um, yeah, that's my kind of feeling of the draws. Yeah, what, would you say, what would you say is the most interesting match, especially in round ah, two? Ah, yeah, possibly, interesting. Round one or, or possibly round two, sorry. Well, talking about round one, I think that maybe that ketsmanovic Echeverry match can be really good uh, okay. because of what we, we said. Uh, probably given also the fact that there's going to be a great atmosphere, I would mention Gael Monfields against Fran Francisco Serundolo. Uh, it can be a very nice one, also because I imagine them to play tomorrow in, on the center court uh, with, you know, nice stuff from, from the French crowd. So it can be really interesting. Korda Urkac, uh, it's been a semi-final yes. in, yes. uh, in, in Shanghai recently. So Urkac was was not really well in the Basel final, honestly. Um, but uh, if he, you know, if he's able to to recover well, it can be a really good one. Even that one second second round clashes, you know, probably um, yeah. The, the Novak match can be interesting, even if I think Novak will win, but can still be an interesting match. Uh, and probably I will also say maybe the winner between Monfils and Ferundolo can can give a great fight against Rude and can can actually be a very very close contest. So probably I would say also that one. Yeah. Um, Give me your pick. Uh, who's gonna win? Who's gonna win this tournament? My God. Uh, 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 mm, 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 mm. Mm. Yeah, I will say that uh... Yeah, I'm thinking about all the pos you know, all the possibilities. Uh if there's, you know, um but I I think I will stick with with Novak for this tournament. Mm. In my opinion, um uh... You know, this is, uh, you know, probably Turin will be more difficult because we know how the ATP finals uh, format can make it very, very difficult. In fact, you know, uh, he won last year, but uh, wasn't really, really that successful here in the past season. So probably in Turin, I'm kind of imagining more, more issues. Uh, given also a little bit of question marks about Alcaraz's form, uh, Medvedev and Sinner coming from, from Vienna, which has been really, really tough uh, for both of them, especially yesterday in the final. Um, I'm still trying to go with, with, with Novak for this one. Also, you know, thinking about how well he usually plays in Paris. Yes. Um, I can't give you a name, honestly, uh, and I'm not going to pick Novak which is very surprising when it comes to me nice. uh, but i think that we're going to be we're going to see a little surprise over here so my pick is that the winner are, is not going to be either novak alcaraz or medvedev ah so, but you can't give me a name <laughs> i can't honestly i can't okay, i just okay, okay. my my gut is telling me that none of the the three guys i mentioned yeah, okay. is going to are going to do it honestly yeah yeah and it's, if, it's it's totally fine i mean i'm i'm not you you know uh, uh I'm not uh, um, the kind of person who discredits the um, the lower ranked player. I, I always think that the surprise can be around the corner. So I I'm more than okay with what you what you're saying. Uh, you know, my 
a little bit of a question mark for the fact that he hasn't played a lot lately. He hasn't played lately, sorry. Um, but, you know, that um, Paris Bercy feeling, uh, you know, it's giving me the fact that he, he he's going to, to play well. But I totally understand what, you, what you're saying. Listen, the, the reason why I uh, decided not to go with him or the other two is because, I, first of all, uh, I think I do think that he's a little rusty, as you said, and that he doesn't mm. care a hundred percent whether he wins or not in Paris. Mm. Uh, he already said that, and we'll talk a little bit uh, more in detail later about you know his priorities for this year. It's Davis Cup, and you know mm. ATP Finals is even more important than Paris for him. Car uh, when it comes to Carlos. Uh, mm, not really had a good run again after uh, after U.S. Open, so not very not very convincing. Also, he you know skipped a couple of weeks, and uh, when it comes to Daniel, I still believe in his curse that you know he can't <laughs> win. He can't win two tournaments. So basically, he won't <laughs> he can't win a tournament anymore. two times. Yeah. So yeah, basically, uh... he, he has to retire from tennis. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I mean, kidding. No, there, I'm there kidding. Are, there Sorry, Danny. <laughs> uh, there are there there are other terms. No, I'm just kidding. Honestly, uh, we'll see about next uh, year. But as of right now, so it's either you know, Sinner or guys who are ranked you know below him. Uh, uh, Rublev would be my 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 pick if I had to. Uh, yeah, just before we uh, go to. A, a different topic. I just wanted to uh, say something when it comes to Novak and Paris Masters. Literally a record hold, holder for most of the things. So most titles, six. Most finals, eight. Most consecutive titles, three. Consecutive finals, again, three. Matches played, uh, 54. Matches won, 45. Uh, consecutive matches won 17 and even most editions played at 17. Uh, oh yeah, one thing I forgot. We saw him and Carlitos, you know, practicing yesterday. What do you think of that? Because I've seen a ton of negative comments when it comes to that. And even, you know, prompt me to write a, a you know, little tweet yesterday that uh, I love what Novak is doing. With younger players, especially Carlos, and I love how he's embracing them because that's something that you know he didn't have when he was you know coming through on the tour. He didn't have you know older players, older greats to basically you know guide him through the tour. So what I'm seeing and the relationship I'm seeing between him and Alcaraz is I just love it honestly. Um. Yeah, uh, I, I watched something about the practice, not all of it, honestly, because I I was really, you know, focused on on the finals yesterday because for me, live matches are you know, the, the, the best possible thing yeah. for me. Uh, even if I, I turned on and so I I had the pleasure to, to see something and also I watched a lot on the social media and uh, so I'm well aware of what happened, uh, even the, the scoreline of the tiebreak, which which Novak won seven seven three seven six. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, overall, uh, I have to say that I I agree with you because for me it's even if it's a rivalry because it is a rivalry, but it's different than the rivalry that he had, for example, with. Federer and Nadal, for example, which were his rivals in, you know, his own era, in his own prime. Exactly. It's different. The, the difference, even of age, between the two players we are talking about, one is born in 1987, one is born 2003. Father uh, and son. So, uh, you know, I, I like this thing because I think also it's, it's great for, for the sport that um still giving it all when it means to to beat him on the court uh and even to to not you know mm, reveal something because i still think that practicing together doesn't really mean that then your rival knows anything uh everything about you uh, but i like it because he it's kind of building a legacy helping also you know kind of helping the tennis world um to, to grow even for the future because you you have a great talent you have a player that can 
possibly, who knows, but can possibly mm, follow your, um, you know, your footsteps uh, in becoming a great of the sport because he is 20, has already won two slams, uh, winning some Masters titles, beat you in the Grand Slam final. So it's, you know, mm, but for me, it's, it's good because uh, it's also nice that he, he builds a legacy also in helping the movement to grow, uh, maybe even giving some advice. I don't, I don't see anything wrong right now because mm, I repeat the difference in terms of uh, two total, totally different generation. It's not going to be a rivery for the ages. It's a rivery that will last, I think, you know, a couple of years, two, three years. I don't know how more Novak is going to, uh, to play. I can't give, you know, uh, a precise quantity, but it's still not a river for, for the ages that you may think that in 10 years' time they're still going to play each other. Uh, so I, I don't see really nothing wrong. And then it's nice to see, for example, uh, even Daniel Medvedev always talks about this, for example, when they, they share the court for a Grand Slam final and then they have the speech. And he always says that Novak was really nice training to him, giving him advices um, when he was, for example, 500 in the world. And look now how, how far I went, because now I'm playing with you in a Grand Slam final. Um, lost twice, beat you once, uh, and you're still nice to me. And I like this because it's really... Um, building a, a legacy through through the players, uh, they they know that he 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 is an all time great and great, and not also for the results on the court, but also because he really tries to to do something positive, uh, even for you know for the guys that are more or less you know substituting him in the goal of, of the tennis um, or, or, you know, we'll do it in, in some years time. Um, and I honestly like this because for me, you know, given the fact that he is uh, 36 right now, uh, so he, he, he is still in, in the final part of his career. So he really doesn't need right now to, you know, um, to hide a lot of things about himself and about his game because he, it's not a, anymore that time, the time to, to, to do so. So I, I am okay with this. And I don't think that these men are, are being too soft by smiling to each other and practicing one next to the other. So I, I'm more than okay with that. Yeah. Uh, by the way, when it comes to Novak's hiatus, as I said, it's been six to seven weeks depending on you know whether you count that participation in davis cup mm. uh, which i honestly don't <laughs> uh, he has done that once in his career i didn't believe it honestly i went through all of his years uh, starting from the year 2007 and he also had a six to seven week break in 2011 which was surprising for me uh it was after us open and again he had the davis cup yeah, but uh, 20, 2011 week. was due to an injury. Yeah, uh, and uh, the next tournament he played was Basel. Uh, so that was uh, he. He had you know uh, occurrences where he missed like four weeks, which happened regularly. You know, it's either after the Australian Open or or Wimbledon, sometimes even U.S. Open. But he never had a long a break this long. Uh, you know, if we don't include any, you know, injuries or anything, you know, COVID related. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how, how he looks. Um, okay. Next, next subject is the year end number one race. You know, as we are, oh. as we are all familiar, it's going to be between him and Carlitos. The current ATP rating uh, rankings as of today are Novak is first with 11,045 points. Uh, Carlos is second with 8,625. However, if we take a look at the live ATP rankings, yeah, the gap exactly. is significantly smaller. It's only 500 points with Novak having 8,955 and Carlos 8,455. Uh, yeah, because our... this week, yeah. this week uh, are dropping 
both the points of last year's Paris Masters, Novak was the finalist, so 600 points, and also last year's ATP Finals, which Novak won as undefeated, and so it's uh, 105,000 points. So. Exactly. Uh, our, our dear friend Yolita, uh, by the way, shout out, shout out to Lita. Uh, we all love her from NullFM. She did some calculations on, on yes. this race. And uh, let me read you this. Uh, Alcaraz can take uh, the number one spot from Novak after Paris if, number one, he wins the title and Novak doesn't make the final. And number two, if he makes the final and Novak doesn't make the quarterfinals. In any other case, Novak uh, is going to keep the number one spot. Uh, the year, uh, the year end, uh, number one spot will still be undecided after after Paris. Yeah. So, based on your predictions and calculations, Novak should uh, mm -hmm. remain world number one at least until Turin. Yeah, I mean, talking about if he is going to lose the number one spot in Paris, it's probably difficult. Uh, I am. I am quite, you know, confident that he's going to to keep it uh, at least till, till Turin. As for the year end number one, uh, well, uh, it's um, it's much more difficult because we we have to take into consideration also the results they they are going to do in Turin, where uh, a lot of points are are on the line. Um, yeah, Carlos did not play last year. Novak uh, Novak won the title, so. It's it's you know it's gonna be yeah, difficult. basically basically we have Paris and Turin uh, with you know two thousand and five hundred points on the line and Novak has an advantage of five hundred points so uh, nothing is really decided five hundred points are still mm, you know quite a few to to let you be in an, an advantage position. Uh, let me do this uh okay for the final the final in turin is 500 points worthy so yeah let's say that if novak wins in paris uh, i'm going to be then uh 900 percent that he's going to be the year end number one yeah, um, uh, your leader also wrote that. Um, listen to this: If Novak wins uh, Turin or ATP Finals undefeated, he will keep the year-end number one, even if Carlos wins Paris and he Novak loses in round one. Uh, but the better he does in Paris, you know, the 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 easier it will be for him to, yeah. to keep hold of that number one spot. Yeah, that's. Uh... Absolutely, because uh, you know, um, but it's not that easy eh? <laughs> to know, to win Turin as, as undefeated. That's why I Paris I'm giving important. a lot. Yeah, I I'm giving a lot of importance in Paris, even because I have the feeling that this year's field in Turin is going to be stronger than last year's. I, uh, I agree with that. Because you know, Medvedev last year was not in good form. And this year he's playing really well. Carlos was not there last year and is going to be there this year. Uh, there's going Sinner, to be Sinner, Rublev. which, you know, Sinner and Rublev, totally different players comparing to, to last year. Uh, so I would say that, you know, even one round robin fit can happen. Uh, exactly. So um, I'm giving a lot of importance in Paris, but if he's going to, you know, do well, um even reaching the final i'll be confident that with a solid result in turin uh, he can you know and uh, end the year as the world number one uh, that said um it's at this point it's um, very difficult to make a prediction because we don't know all the draws we don't know in who will they face in turin in the group um so so it's very difficult to make an entire prediction for the year and number one race um if not only based by you know uh sensations uh so i i won't really i don't want to to give an exact prediction i still think that 
probably Novak with two solid results is going to to do that. But you know, uh, he a lot of effort is required, and that has to be said. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention or to ask you, uh, you probably saw that interview he did, you know, when he uh, landed in Paris. Uh, and I, I want to read you some quotes of his. For sure. And, and, and let me know uh, what I think of it. Uh, first of all, uh, when asked about, uh, you know, how how he would you know rank or whatever what he thinks of his year he said that i i obviously had a fantastic year so far winning three of four slams and playing another final at wimbledon at the beginning of the year i was saying that the grand slams are the priorities they still remain the priorities which is something that we also talked about uh for the next season and the tournaments uh, where i want to do my best Djokovic also said it uh so i couldn't ask for a better season to be honest one match away from winning all four slams is something i would sign right away at the beginning of the season if someone told me that would be the case do you agree with him yes would you I would agree. you do that if you were in his position yes for sure <laughs> i mean let, let, I mean, let me ask you this let me ask you this would you do that uh when it comes to 2024 yes. or you or no, yes no, no, really yes yes, yes. yes I would, sorry I would, but I would not have done it because I still I'm, I'm, wanna I still wanna believe in that dream of winning four slams in a that's for sure. Middle. That's for sure. But uh even if you are the greatest player of all time, when you are approaching the season, you are turning 37. Uh, you know, if someone is going to tell you you are going to win three grand slams out of the four, well, it's an amazing result. Uh I mean Novak would go to 27 titles would you ever imagine a few years ago at 27 grand slam titles uh despite all the belief that you have in him uh, i mean i i would sign for winning three slams in a season honestly i know that it's it's the dream but you know probably two slams i'm still gonna be no i don't sign let's see but three slams are are quite a lot honestly so let i me, i think that everyone even the greatest player of all time would sign for that uh, listen to this and i'm gonna ask you a very difficult question <laughs> uh, of course um, when you know when asked about you know year end number one and uh, his goals and whatever of course my greatest motivation is still love for the game which i love honestly this is me saying it. i really like competing so as simple as that then i always have goals and to win another slam to be number one again to finish the year as number one uh those are let's say the big goals um of course next year is the olymp or are the olympic games i really want to do well in the olympic games represent my country davis cup is something that still gives me a lot of inspiration of course, any tournament where I play, I want to win, no doubt. But the big goals are the ones that I mentioned. So I think it's important to have clarity, to have goals and ambitions and move towards them. The questions I wanted to ask you is, of course, it's hypothetical. And it's basically the extension of what I you know, asked you like a minute ago. If you, uh, you, ha you have two options for the year 2024 win all four slams oh, no no sorry that that would be easy win three slams again or win just the olympic gold medal <sighs> i know <laughs> for me but you know uh i am i'm not there i i've never been to the olympic games uh, so probably I'm I'm not very 100% aware. So me Mario, I would probably pr you know prefer for myself maybe winning three slams because for tennis you know winning three slams in a season is you know yeah. But no no forget forget you. Forget uh, but you. talking forget about you. Novak, I'm probably thinking that the gold medal probably is number one goal goal. For, yeah, for next that, year, that, that's, that's the only in my opinion, see. because um, we are even at a point. Maybe in the future, there are going to be someone who will win twenty-eight slams, maybe. But as things stand now, you know, 
is it really changing that much for the history of the sport if you have 27 or 26? Let's no. change. Uh, while, you know, also having the Olympic goal, which it's not probably the most important thing in tennis, so things considering, but for, for you all. as an athlete, for you as an athlete is a very important thing because for, for every athlete, the Olympic Games are, you know, the I, moment. I don't, yeah, I don't kind of agree with that. And we are talking about the sport where that doesn't hold that much significance. The other sport that it's I not agree. I agree that in is, tennis. I agree that in yeah. tennis is. But, but I if, think it's because it's him and because of how, you know, because patriotic him, he is because and how him. much he loves Serbia and, you know, the defeats. Yes. But the... I, I'm imagining that I'm talking about a player who has already done all the possible things in tennis. And that's why I'm, I, I was making that speech about the Olympic Games. Winning even that would be, you know, truly nothing more <laughs> has to be done in, in your career. Then you can continue for all the time you want still winning titles. But, you know, uh, he would take... Even the only big goal he, he hasn't reached yet, and uh, you know, w would there even be any debate about the greatest athlete of all time? Right now, there kind of is a debate, but if he wins all the slams and even the Olympic goals, in my opinion, you are going even to close to you know. No, that uh, af after that, you know, the the we're not gonna be talking about sporting achievements. We're gonna be talking about you know, off court legacy and and, and successes. Because yeah, in terms of on the court, I really don't think that there has ever been an athlete. I mean, people say you know Michael Jordan, which is true. People say Michael Michael Phelps, which is true. But again, you know, swimming. That's basically people follow swimming, you know, when they're Olympics. So that's basically every four years. These guys are playing year in and year out for 11 months. Yeah, rea reality is that it's really difficult to compare all the sports. It is. And it that is. has to be said because every sport, for example, there are sports in which the Olympic Games are the most important event of, of yeah. an athlete's career. Exactly. For Michael tennis, Phelps mentioned. And for, for tennis, it's not exactly like that. Uh, but still, you know, winning that Olympic medal, since you have the opportunity to, to do so, and we saw how much he, he was caring about that in Tokyo. Uh, he also tried to, to sign for, for the mixed doubles because regardless of its singles, doubles, he wanted the Olympic, um, you know, that medal. And so I think that his number one goal probably would be that. Uh, considering how much uh, it, it means for him. Uh, of course, for me, it's not going to change a lot in the perception I have of his career. But uh, if, you, if you are asking me this question, probably he, he would say that. Probably. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But probably, yes. Yeah, I'm glad because I completely share that opinion. Uh, it's, it's Olympic gold or bust next year for him. Trust me, he's not going to care... Well, he is, of course, you know, always when, when he wins a Grand Slam, but he's not going to care if he doesn't win the Olympic gold medal because that's the literally the only thing missing from his resume. Yeah, and, and honestly... He's not, he's not going to retire without having the Olympic gold. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. Listen, I told you my take on him. He's going to play until the LA Olympics in 2028. Okay. Okay, you have this, this opinion. Okay. Honestly, honestly. He's not going to allow Andy Murray to have more gold medals than him. <laughs> ah, so two Olympic medals. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can't wait to, to get Scott, Scott Barkley uh, on our pod to talk about, you know, Andy Murray and Novak Djokovic. Uh, okay, before we wrap this up. Buddy, yeah, he has he uh, has a lot of valid reason to claim that Murray is the GOAT. You know, yeah, that's true. That's he, true. He has the Olympics a lot of are, them. The Olympics are the most important thing. Uh, let me no, ask you. About... By the way, overall, I, I give a lot of importance, but not because of what that means in the judgment of a career, but because it's it's an important event. You want to win it. You it know, is the most important sporting event. Uh, on the yeah. Globe. So even even if for tennis, probably it's not even that much as a Grand Slam, but still, you know, it's it's a goal for your career, in my opinion. 
that that's that's true uh okay as i told as i to uh, told you before we wrap this up i want to um talk to you uh, about those uh novak comments that he made about those rafa comments <laughs> and yes. before um, unfortunately we were absent for what it's going to be three weeks now so we didn't have the chance uh, but as I said in that interview with the Sportal Serbia that Novak um, did with uh, Jelena Medic, he gave he gave you know his thoughts uh, about again those Rafa comments from from uh, October no September yeah sorry uh, these are Novak's words I've seen that his comments went viral. Uh, that many people spoke about it. Uh, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. How he interprets someone uh, else is a certain context, etc. That's all I can say. Rafa is a great champion, and I respect and appreciate him as such, as a great champion, my biggest rival, and as a player who contributed to uh, shaping my game and to results I've accomplished. Uh, Djokovic said. He added, I have no intention of speaking in a negative light about him or Roger Federer. My respect towards them supersedes some negative opinions I might have. Again, that's Rafa's opinion and I, of course, don't agree. I have my opinion, but I won't share it as I don't want us to go deeper into that. There is no need for that. Uh, did you like that answer? Did something you know stick out? Uh, from what he said or what was what i mean I, I know it's been a couple of weeks but what were your first impressions your first thought when you read that interview because what, i was i, I can say one, I, I, i'm gonna i'm gonna use one word to describe how i felt pride or i was proud of you. um my opinion is going to be really really short because the answer is perfect uh Literally. i don't think Literally. Uh, even if I try to think, uh, if I have to add anything, mm, I don't think there's anything to add because he, it is a very well put answer um, with class and respect. Um, he, he has shown one more time that he is a very, very classy athlete and person because he always speaks um, in a very polite and reasonable way. Uh, so um, really I don't think there's anything to add the, the answer was incredibly well put uh, we know how how much he's able to, to talk in the proper way even in press conferences uh, in interviews uh, in you know trophy speeches uh, it's always everything really really uh, very well well thought and well said um he's always himself uh says what he, ne he needs to say and i'm yeah really no, not not many things to say because the the answer is in my opinion is mm, you know perfect for for what he he wanted to say no yes, no I, disrespect I, I, completely, I completely agree with that no no disrespect nothing to you know to attack <laughs> because it's a very well put answer in my opinion and so uh you know I, I don't have a lot to to say because uh you know the answer is pretty clear respectful and uh, uh you know it's also the perfect answer possible to 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 end the debate and to you know to move on uh knowing that he disagrees but still respects his, his great rivals and it's great to to know because we uh, we know how how classy can be in, in very much different, very many different circumstances. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, but let let me play a devil's advocate for a second, and I want your uh, short answer on this. I'm going to read this. I have no intention of speaking in a negative light about him or Roger Federer. My respect towards them supersedes some negative opinions I might have. For sure. Uh, what would you say are those negative opinions that he might have? What oh, do you, what do you sure. suspect? What do you suspect? Give give me give me an example. Well, uh, let me think a little bit. Uh, for sure, a lot of their careers, they've taken a lot of, you know, a lot of decisions, and so for sure, you're not going to always agree with uh, with what someone says and. 
for example, when probably when they, you know, uh, didn't want to, to share with him the, the PDPA project, uh, I remember that they were uh, a little bit, you know, um, doubtful were... about that, put some something on Twitter, I remember, both of them, yeah. uh, rough, saying rough that, uh, you know, uh, saying that it was, you know, he, it, it was a bad, opi- uh, uh, you know, a bad solution in their opinion. Um, that's an example I can remember. So, and, and it's just to say that, that of course, some things happen that, you know, you can agree, you can disagree because uh, they are three different people, three different individuals with three different way of act, think. Uh, and for sure, uh, you know, there's going to be something uh, you you disagree. Uh, and so I really like that part of the answer because he he clearly says that even when disagree disagrees with with something, he still still the respect the respect you know has been really really high even in the disagreement and that's really mature and I really I really like that part of the answer. Yeah, me too. Uh, okay, that would be it for for today's episode. Uh, Mario, but I want to thank you once again for joining me after that two three weeks. Uh, absence that we had uh, it was you know really awesome and fulfilling to talk to you uh, about tennis and novak again uh thank you before... thank you it's been it's been, any, it's, it's been very very good for me i really enjoyed it as you know as every time and i i hope everyone also will will enjoy what we 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 have said during this yeah. hour yeah uh before we go uh, i have to do what i always do and that's to ask you guys to like this video share it on social media or with your friends and leave your comments and feedbacks you know uh, down below all those things uh, help with the youtube algorithm and our promotion basically on this platform also if you're new here or haven't done that already i'll ask you to subscribe to this channel and turn that notification bell on in order not to miss any uh, future episodes that's the simplest way of supporting our work and i and we thank you for that okay as i said that's it thank you buddy again next week when we do this hopefully novak is going to be lifting the trophy in paris for the seventh time uh you'll be right i'll be wrong but we'll talk about it nonetheless so thanks again and guys we'll see you in uh our new episode next week goodbye everyone see you bye bye